if someone wants to go and do the exact same thing that I want to do, chances are they're not going to do it the way that I want to do it. It's like peak arrogance. You feel like you just have everything figured out. Yeah. No one can tell you how the world works. You're like, why am I so wise and so young? Even the fact that you see these things happening for you already puts it in motion. That was the question, right? So how does it feel going from one of probably the most popular podcasts to one of the most niche unknown ones? <laughs> uh, honestly, the stakes have gotten a lot higher. <laughs> <laughs> the, room, the room is smaller and therefore mm -hmm. I feel like more pressure to be like interesting somehow. <laughs> yeah, we don't have a great studio set up here. I just trap you in a corner. <laughs> <laughs> and then so it, I, it's that's the point is uh, if we have a guest on STS, they have to be maximum uncomfortable. Well, I'm taking it upon myself to be as loungy as possible. You yeah. know, first guest ever to put my feet up on the desk. And this is going to be a nightmare later if this just messes with the autofocus. I'm going to be really oh, upset. No way. I'll keep my. I'll I think keep my I think it'll be stuff. fine. I think it's like face detection. Okay. So we should be we should be okay here. But yeah, man, you just got back from the UK. Mm -hmm. How long How long were you there for? Uh, I was there for eight days, but felt a lot longer. <laughs> mm. Yeah, I, I uh, never feel like it's long enough whenever I go on parkour trips. I always end up, do you, do you get the feeling, you know, where it's like, it's not FOMO, but you're, you're leaving, you're getting ready to be head back home and you're like, I need more time. Yeah, well, Dom was out there too and like, he, I, I went down to Brighton after the event that I was there for Project Underground, and like, so Dom comes to to meet me and stuff. And because I've only planned like so many days after the event, I only get like one day to hang out with him. He's like, "Well, why did I come down here then? <laughs> why am I here? Why did I come? If you're just gonna leave like one day in?" But it, it's hard because like, there's there's such a fine balance with traveling where like. You know, after an event, you want to hang out for a little bit. Mm -hmm. You want to kind of take in the space. Like, especially when you're in England, you want to go and like hit all the spots. Everyone's like, come here, come check this out. Go to, go to London, check out Yard, go to Bristol, go to Brighton. Like everyone's trying to pull you in a thousand different directions. And you got to just like pick a direction, go and try to predict exactly how many days you need in this place. Mm -hmm. And most of the time you're wrong, but it can go in either direction. It's like, oh crap, like I just planned way too many days in this place and I'm staying on a friend's couch. I don't even feel welcome anymore. Like this is really strange. Or it's like, damn, this trip was too short. There's so many homies out here. And like, I feel like things are just getting started, but that's just kind of like a travel skill you build up, I guess. Okay. So you're talking about this in a way right now where I feel like I cannot relate whatsoever. <laughs> I don't know if you saw any of my experience in Brighton around this time last year, but I went out there and I, I, was, uh, I was in Belgium, right? So mm -hmm. we were doing the SPL qualifier and I said early, I was like, you know what? It has been a minute since I have been out to anywhere in Europe to do parkour. And it's so long that I think the last time was maybe 2014 or something. Mm -hmm. And between then and now, because 2014 was, we had just opened the gym. Uh, barely anyone in parkour knew who I was. I hadn't done anything cool yet to the point where it's like, all right, you, you make a competition and you start um, making media and stuff. And then people kind of get to know who you are. And I felt like, oh, I know people now. Mm hmm Apparently I don't. Apparently I still don't. Damn. <laughs> um, I, the, the one person in the UK that I um, message with semi-regularly is Callum. Mm. And he was supposed to be there. And then he ended up, I think, doing Gov Games. Oh, like the Dubai one? Yeah. And then I found out that the only other person that I knew in Brighton was Tom Taylor. But I kind of had this impression that I was going to go to Brighton and I was just going to know everybody and, and I wasn't in a training mood too I was dealing with like pretty bad bout of uh, jumpers knee at the time and around the time of the trip I was like starting to feel like training again and yeah like I tried to vlog some of it and you know scraped what I could from that to put up on Origins YouTube but it was just yeah basically a trip of where I didn't do much parkour I did get to meet with some local people from Brighton but it was it was a really it felt really tough. It felt really tough to do. Like, like, like you're trying to like yeah. 
pull teeth just to like make anything happen. I don't even know if pull teeth yeah. is the right word, but like it's just so difficult to get anything started. Yeah, like Brighton was the wrong and the right choice. It was the right choice in that I hadn't been to Brighton yet. I'd been to London, so I'd been to IMAX on a previous trip to the UK. I'd been to Vauxhall before it got taken down yeah. and done like solo, done like a solo session there yeah. and that kind of thing. And I really felt like this was going to be the time that I was actually going to hook up with people I knew. Yeah. And yeah, Brighton just seemed like that was that was the wrong move because nah. there weren't a lot of people um, wanting to train. And well, what time of year was that? Was that it was like, like February, March? Ooh, so yeah, ooh. not not great. Um, Nobody even wants to train here in February and March. Like we've got a like a group chat here and like. Mm-hmm. I get ghosted so much in that chat. <laughs> nobody, <laughs> nobody ever wants to train, especially like March, February. You bringing that up actually got me thinking uh, about the. You bringing up your trip to London, like you know, everyone's got to go see IMAX and this mm-hmm. and that. Like, there's like the aspect of parkour tourism that comes with traveling. Mm-hmm. When I went and saw IMAX for the first time, I cried. <laughs> Dude, like actual I, tears. Tears, actual tears. What's like, what's wrong with you? Oh my God, it was so emotional, man. Like this was like 2015. I had been doing parkour for like mm-hmm. five years and I show up like I'm, I'm, I'm visiting and stuff and I got to see IMAX and I show up and I'm just like imagining everything that's gone mm-hmm. down there. I was like, oh my God, like Kai Willis calling this. And, and I, I remember Livewire did this. Year. I'm just walking around like pointing out different spots to my homie Rusty who's showing me around, just being so emotional and embarrassing about it. <laughs> I was like, oh, that was a real like genuine cry moment for me. <laughs> I, 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 I did not have the same. I mean, I went to IMAX first time with uh, Gloria. I met up with um, Christian McPhee, who's a name you probably don't know. No. Nope. Because he... He used to be somewhat prominent in the UK scene, and then he quit and uh, became a really good weightlifter. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, but he actually stayed with me in Vancouver for a bit, so uh, we met up, and I went to IMAX, and this is where I got plagued with what I usually get plagued with whenever I go to Europe, as I, I never am not injured when, yeah. I'm, in, when I'm in Europe, and okay. so that, uh, that, for that trip, I just had like back pain. Uh, <laughs> just like random back pain. Yeah, that's not fair. Maybe from the flight. Maybe from I don't know. But <sighs> uh, yeah, I, I roll up to IMAX and I just looked. I just looked at stuff. Damn. Yeah. Didn't didn't want to do anything. Um, I th- sometimes I think that's like the proper parkour tourism though. If it's like spot tourism, yeah, is you just go and be like, oh yeah, this is <laughs> there's you know, that there's that wall and they did this. Sweet. I mean, that's one approach. Like I want to <laughs> like when I go parkour touriming, mm-hmm. like I want to. My dream is to like leave my mark on like whatever that spot is. It never mm-hmm. happens. But like I've thought mm-hmm. about reversing IMAX 2. I think it's IMAX 2, mm-hmm. the two walls for so long. Mm-hmm. I no, just have no one hit that yet. People have, people have, but like I want to do it. Okay. Or even like I think if if I'm at like peak athleticism, I would love to double reverse it. I would be the mm-hmm. first person to do that. Mm-hmm. But that one would be freaky. Like I I'm not even close to like, I'm, I'm a little close to reverse praying the one here, but I feel like with enough run and enough just like trip energy of like, oh, like I got to like bust out. Like mm-hmm. I'm here. This is my one chance. If I was at like peak energy, I would love to double reverse that. Nice. <sighs> All right. You, you just did, you just did a very Josh thing right now. And I, and I do want to get into uh, some of the topics today and talking about you, but you just did a very Josh thing. <laughs> that I actually find is usually a, a rule that most people don't want to break in the entrepreneur space, but you called out a goal. Yeah. And this is something that I actually see you do on social media all the time and yeah. in person is you will tell people like, this is what I want to do. This is what I'm going to do. And most of the time you actually go out and do it. Whereas a lot of times if, if someone posts a goal and there's actually been like, I don't know if you've heard of like studies that I'm not going to site studies right now for <laughs> Do it, man. this episode, but um, it, it has been a, a behavior that's, that's been studied where um, people that often like announce a goal, the positive feedback you get from the announcement makes you less likely to oh. actually go achieve goal because it, you already feel good about it. You right? poke, you've poked a hole in the dopamine lemon yeah. and the juice starts coming exactly. out. Exactly. Yeah. And, so, and so you saying like, oh, I want to go do this move here. Someone might react to it and be like, sick and you're like yeah sick idea and then 
motivation to go do said thing <laughs> drops down. Um, and so some people really uh, follow this rule and, you know, like they won't, like I, I'm kind of half, half. I'll announce like some of the stuff I'm going to do, but most of the time, most of the time you don't hear me talking about stuff that I want to do. Most right. of the time it's like just movement in silence. Just, yeah. And then, <laughs> and then coming out with it, but which can be a pain too, because if I'm working on something and maybe someone's being critical of like SPL or origins or something, and I'm like, working on it just shut up we'll, you know, it's gonna it's gonna happen just you know because you know it's just it's just words anyways doesn't really matter but um is this something you've noticed about yourself though or, or is yeah. that just i've always i've always kind of been not even kind of like i've always been very vocal about what i want to do if someone wants to go and do the exact same thing that i want to do chances are they're not going to do it the way that i want to do it um and if they do it better that's great but like I don't know. I, I, I see goals in like a non-competitive space because it's it works in the space that I'm in. Like what I do is about me doing it. It's not about the fact that it gets done. It's like like say like like a parkour news show or like a parkour um, news wrap up. Go ahead and do it. You're not going to do it like me. Like, you're, yeah. like I, I've, got, I've got my own history and very few will have the same passion the same training, the same connections, the same this and that to make that stuff happen. And then even if they do, like, go ahead. Mm -hmm. I'm still going to do me. So speaking out those goals, like, it, it also, uh, in, in my perspective, it doesn't, for me, it doesn't take away the, re the reward of the pursuit of doing it. It makes it, like, it, it actually, like, puts the pressure on to mm -hmm. think about it more and to uh, actually get it done because it feels like I've made, like, a like a social contract that like I've said that I'm going to do this thing. Mm. So it's it, almost the reverse effect. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like it, it's, it, it makes it almost more likely to happen. Mm -hmm. And then even if it doesn't, I'm fine saying I'm going to do something and then not end up ending up doing it. If it's not actually in line with mm -hmm. how I want to be. Would, would you say then that sometimes like the way you use social media is, kind of like because you are someone that like documents quite a bit of like what you're doing like on a on a day-to-day -day basis like yeah you do you, you do a great I'm job drinking of, coffee uh, yeah. <laughs> look at my stupid coffee <laughs> um but would you say like you almost use it as like accountability too yeah like it's it's a connection tool it keeps me in tune with the community which, which i'm really passionate about it's it's a journal mm -hmm. like it, it it's it's a it's a way of like documenting everything that's going on in like a televisable way mm -hmm. and, and yeah it, it is kind of like a, a an accountability thing that was the question right yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah i got i got stuck in all the other things that it is but mm -hmm. yeah it, it it is a thing that that keeps me accountable to those goals and like I, i'm a very goal oriented person or or i have been mm -hmm. um at certain points of my life like there was there was times where like the only thing that about me was my goals. Mm. And then I've also kind of, I've flipped to the other side at certain points where it's like, I don't want to set any goals. Mm -hmm. I don't I, like, I just want to float about and whatever gets done gets done. And I've kind of just like flip flopped from one to the other as it's convenient. And right now it's kind of in like a, you know, there's, there's one or two goals or things, but like, there's enough processes in place where magic can just like start to like pop up and things that I've dreamed of doing just end up getting accomplished like mm -hmm. along the way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, just kind of going back to your frequency, I guess, like your social media frequency. I, I've been on like a pretty big break at the moment and I've always kind of struggled because I don't know what I want to share anymore actually mm. right now. Do you feel and like no one cares enough? No, I just, if, if I don't care, you know, uh, it, like even like recently, like I have some clips on my phone from like training recently mm -hmm. and I've like gone to post it and this doesn't, this didn't happen before, but it's just a more like recent thing. I don't know if it's cause I put out a video recently and everything, but I just, I just like don't care. I'm just like, ah, just, what's the, what's the what's point? The use? Well, it just, it doesn't, cause I'll fully admit that if I'm posting on, social media it's not for me mm -hmm. um if you're 
like do you like do you feel like it's for you do you feel like it's for other people a lot of the time it's more for me <laughs> like like i like, let, i'm let my me, own biggest let fan. me let, let, let me rephrase that like yeah. like are you because I, I have heard this from people as a reason but i feel like if you're trying to get followers it's not for you then it's mm. it's it's for you in the sense of like a career right or to leverage those followers in a way mm-hmm. like to, to build your own source of like leverage but then but then it's not for you. Mm-hmm. Um, but I have heard the term of people are just using it like a scrapbook or a journal. Mm-hmm. I have never cared for that. Like ah, I, okay. I don't need to see. Vi- I'm, I'm never gonna go back. Not never. You but never like, go back. I don't really. No, I don't oh. really go back to like look at like. Oh yeah, this I did this before, and then this is better, and this like occasionally I'll have to bring that up if I if I redo something yeah. that I've done before, just to kind of see how I did it. Like if I'm just to reaffirm like, oh yes, I'm, I'm, I've improved now. Yeah. But um, no, I'm not a big, like I don't take a lot of photos in life. I don't do, like I'm not a, a scrapbooky person, you know. Yeah. I, and I think that's what it is, is like we used to probably pre-social media, pre-Facebook, everything is people kept scrapbooks and journals and things. And yeah. I just was never one of those guys. Yeah. But it sounds like you might be. Yeah. Well, even like, like I, I've always been interested in, in sharing like what I'm doing and even like I, I'll, I'll even backtrack a little bit to that statement of like, you know, the con- some of the content I make is for me. Like, uh, for example, I think I'm the one who watches my clips the most because I, I just sometimes after you post a sick clip, you're like, I did that. <laughs> you just watch it over and over again and just imagine I, I, I always just imagine myself like, I don't know. 30, 40 years down the line where, you know, maybe parkour has changed or like the way I practice it is different or maybe I don't train anymore. I don't know. Like I'm, I'm open to all of it, but I just imagine myself in a less capable state being like, this is how I used my youth. Like I'm very excited and interested in that. Um, like it's not, it's not like a followers thing or anything like that, but Mm -hmm. to take it like all the way back to its origin. When I was a kid and I would make little like Lego sets and stuff like Mm -hmm. I would I would only be happy with it after I had shown my mom. Like I I, I always wanted to, I, you know, I was I was interested in the the world of creation and and making things. And as soon as the act of creation was done, the next thing I was interested in was what do you get from this? Or mm-hmm. like are are you interested in this? Do you, do you like this? Uh, are you interested in this? So the the idea of like creating and sharing has kind of always been integral to my being. But it didn't really have a it, it it didn't have a strong base until my art became parkour because before parkour I hadn't figured out like what my art was I kind I knew I was like not I, I felt I I knew I felt unusual and even even before parkour I did vlogs. Mm-hmm. Uh, I had this YouTube channel called Jude's. It was J zero 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 DS, and I've I've deleted all the videos. I wish I never I wish I never deleted them. Um, How old were you? I was. This was between twelve and fourteen, mm-hmm. and I was like a little micro celebrity in my mm-hmm. in my junior high, and like I I was thinking about starting a t shirt business, and I had this song called Potato Milk, and it was just it was just the most like XD random. I'm gonna talk to a camera and scream and shout and do all this stuff, and yeah, parkour w- was the first time that that energy had kind of found a, a base. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Interesting. And then it takes us like to today where you're kind of doing the same thing, but with, uh, <laughs> with parkour, right? Isn't that funny? Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that funny how like full circle <laughs> yeah. that stuff is? Yeah. I, I think any, I have stuff cause I, uh, I went to film school and when I was in film school, I made like uh, almost feature length film. Mm-hmm. Which I, like, I didn't know that I'm about you. I'm wildly embarrassed about it, thinking about it right now. Oh, no. It, like, borders on, like, the Matrix. Like, there's, like, some fight scenes in it. There's some stuff. It still is on YouTube. Really? And I kind of want to take it down. Because it's just, like... Don't take it down. It's the type of thing you that... Because <laughs> you can't take it back. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> I mean, like, maybe you want to take it back now. But yeah. at some point, you're going to be like, I want to see that again. 
and it's not going to be there anymore. I don't think I ever do. No, no. Right, because you're like, not a not a wormhole guy. I would have. <laughs> I there's there's certain things about like my. Okay, here's here's a question. How how old are you right now? I'm turning 28 this month. Okay. Yeah. Do you do you know like the sense of like when your age kind of like 16 to 24 is like particularly I think for for men for young men it's like it's like peak arrogance. <laughs> yeah. Where like you feel like you just have everything figured out. Yeah. No one can tell you how the word world works. You're like, why am I so wise and so young? <laughs> like, how do people not know everything? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I don't know if it's just like getting more into like having to live an adult life that's, that sort of changes that. But yeah, I, I just, I don't want to associate with myself <laughs> of that age anymore. That's fair. And so like watching anything from that, because I, I was, I was like 20 yeah. right, when I made this and it it's... Um, yeah, it's it's painful to think about, so I'd rather not. <laughs> but in in some sense, like, do you feel like the echo of that still exists in things that you create today? Or do you feel like that was a completely off-track blip for you? Like, was that, like, a part of the path that got you to where you are today? And, and like, because you, you do still, like, you're, you're clearly interested in... Uh, entertainment still because you you put out parkour videos you put on SPL which is like the greatest parkour competition on the planet like you you still are able to put on a show with that entertainment mindset like do you do you think that your past in in film and television school mm-hmm. fed into it in any way yeah, so I think if we catch up to today, if I, for whatever reason, wasn't owning a gym and wasn't coaching, I would probably be a content creator. Okay. I would probably. And I think now, if if all the technology that exists right now existed, shit, 17 years ago, cool. 18 years, 18 years ago, mm-hmm. when I was in film school, I probably would have never went the path I did. Damn. Because everything that exists right now, like the amount that you can create with a single camera and your own editing system Mm -hmm. is so much greater than what existed 18 years ago that I would have felt much more in control and and felt like I had much more of a career path to do what I wanted to do Mm -hmm. because I wanted to be in control. Mm -hmm. Like I went into cinematography school and I want, but I really wanted to like direct and just, just, I just was control freak, wanted to control everything. And so the idea of getting into the film industry and being like a PA and like working my way up was just so painful. um, And so I mean, after doing one year of film school, it just, it just, it gave me a bad taste in my mouth about it, that Mm -hmm. that's something I didn't want to do. And yeah, chose the, chose the, I had, I had kind of like two, I I kind of felt like I would always do both. I'm going to be like an athlete i'm gonna be like into working out and into parkour but i'm also gonna like make films and then i just kind of dropped the filmmaking one kind of fell away when one rose to prominence and the cool thing now is i feel like i i could uh eventually do more with content and do more with like filmmaking and that might be something you see out of me in the in the future Mm -hmm. um Right now, I'm really focused on making Origins a success and, and SPL a success. So it that's, seems to be working. <laughs> it yeah. seems to be working pretty well right now. We'll see. We'll see. Yeah. Okay. But anyways, um, back to you, man. Um, so I, I kind of want to talk about the movement, like where you are right now. Yeah. We talked a little bit about like past Josh and stuff, but I kind of want to bridge, bridge the gap here of you're on how many episodes of the movement now? I'm just about to record my 29th. Sick. Yeah. Okay. And it's, I think, has very quickly rose to probably like one of the most celebrated, like regular pieces of content in parkour. Like I don't, I don't feel like that's a big stretch or exaggeration when I say that because I think there's, there's nothing else like it. There's absolutely like you have podcasts like this one where I, I almost, uh, I'm also telling Tom that I try to avoid being like a current events, like we're not trying to be journalists, we're not trying to trying to do that. And yeah. then you have, you know, store and like parkour punditry where they'll kind of cover parkour events, but again, mm-hmm. it's in podcast form, and that's often too long form for people. But you're There's like too much the, room to wander. Yeah, <laughs> like you're even the, in the PPP we did, like we were talking about snakes and ladders yeah. for some reason. <laughs> yeah, so so you're the only thing that is really condensing it. Like the only thing I can compare it to is the flow show. Yeah. Do you, do you feel like you've replaced the flow show? 
Sure. Yeah. Because there, or was that ever like a goal? Um, oh, it's, it, it's that, that's a tough one to answer. Cause like, I love the flow show. I, I loved finding out about new athletes. Wait, which, I loved seeing which, them. which era of the flow show. Oh, the, the Tim Sheaf era. Yeah. 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 Tim Sheaf, not <laughs> Trev. Who the frick was that? <laughs> Who? You know? Uh, no, and and I was even like a big Tim Sheaf fan, and in some ways, like I, I still follow him, like I still appreciate him. Like I've watched his darker paths and his lighter paths and stuff. So that was uh, a draw as well was being interested in in the person providing the news. I was very inspired by him. I loved I loved Giles compiles, and yeah, the thing the two the two of those shows shared was their primary goal of just showing everything that goes on in parkour and giving you an idea of how much movement there is in the community. Cause like, if you're outside of that bubble, it just seems like, it, it's so easy to think that there's nothing happening in parkour. Parkour is getting stagnant. Parkour is not growing. There's nothing new happening. There's like, and, and when people would say that to me before I even had the show, I was like, you're so wrong, dude. Like the, the because the, the the position that I've found myself in with parkour because of all the fun networking I've done through either being an athlete or a personality or just being annoying <laughs> or any anything like that, um, it's put me in such a great central position that I've got a bird's eye view of all of it. Like I see, I like not not every single thing that happens in the community because I've still got some pretty crazy blind spots, but. There's just, I, I see so much going on in parkour and I'm so passionate about it that I can't shut up about it. And and so, yeah, when, when Giles Compiles went away, there was this great big void to fill. And I, I saw the chance to finally do that. And I kind of saw myself moving in that direction at some point, but I was kind of waiting for life to deliver me there at some at, at, at any at some point I just want to say I didn't want to say at some point again <laughs> but yeah I was, I was waiting for that all to happen and then when I was in need of a personal project it all kind of came to me at once I was like I've got a studio um, I've been doing stand-up comedy for a little bit I've got acting training I really want to have a project uh, of my own going on where I've got full creative control, kind of the, the same thing that you were seeking and in being in film. Like I want to be the writer. I want to be the director. I want to be the actor. I want to do all that. And that's tough to do in film, but to do it in like a internet show kind of format, it just seemed like I had all the tools at my disposal already. And yeah, the, the information just seems to come to me. So, so it would be rude not to share it with everybody. So it feels like a lot of this um, direction kind of happened after moving to Vancouver. Mm -hmm. Cause I, I, you know, I, I remember when I met you, but I don't know if you remember when we met in Calgary. I remember exactly when we met. <laughs> I remember the exact session cause I did you a precision the ski. Yeah, the, <laughs> the Fifth Street Planners, yeah, on, in Calgary. I was like, who's this guy? <laughs> cause Brett, uh, you you had come to train with Brower, right? Yeah. That, that, that's all I knew. I was like, mm -hmm. "Cool, this is Brower's homie, and we're training. Mm -hmm. That's cool." You know, Brower seems to respect him. Seems interesting enough. Um, so I figured I would go for uh, precision and land on my ass. <laughs> I have that clip somewhere. <laughs> Still, no, yeah, no, I, I I definitely remember that day. And then when me and the Pody Boys, formerly Urban Wolf Pack, that was, that was our name, when, when we went out to PKBC, because that was what a Calgary athlete would do. Like you reach a certain level of prominence and it seems like all of the Calgary athletes go to PKBC and throw down. Like that, that's what all of our, our predecessors did. So we, we went and did that and I was like, oh shit, like Renee runs this whole thing. <laughs> like this, this guy where I was like, oh wait, I had no idea who this guy was. And and all all like and now he runs this the biggest jam I had ever seen. <laughs> it was yeah that blew my mind. I do like going incognito. Um, I, <laughs> <laughs> I had no idea like, who's this yeah, guy. I I don't think I ever would love. I, I never want to. Well, that's not true. But it is it is nice to like be able to like meet and train with people and then just not tell them where I'm from or like what I'm 
what I have my hands in. Yeah. Um, Cause it's like, they're going to oh, find out later. Yeah. It's yeah. just like, Oh, can we just, can we just hang out and uh, you know, do parkour? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, it, it can, it can almost be like a, a separating factor for people to appreciate your work too much, especially in like initially meeting them. Cause it gets to a point where, the, where they're like, Hey, well, I, I love your show so much. It's, it's so cool. The origins is so awesome. The, the jam's great. You must do so much. I was like, wow. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Eh. <laughs> what do you do after that? Like it, 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 it kind of, it, it, re, it can mess up your initial meeting if, if someone's just gonna like gush over you the second yeah. that they. I meet mean, at you. the same time, I, I do, I do enjoy it um, if people come up to me at a jam or a competition and say that like something that I've put up there into parkour uh, had an inf- had an impact on them. Yeah. Or they're like, or they it listen nice to SCS or something. Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm all about that. Like yeah. I, um, if uh, like if you're listening to this and you ever see me anywhere, please come say hi. Uh, I would it would absolutely mean the world to me. Um, don't, don't don't be weird. Just just come say hi and like let me know who you are. It's it's uh, let's just train it's awesome. for me. Yeah. <laughs> let's let's just train. <laughs> let, dap me up. Let's train. Tell me after. <laughs> <laughs> I get I get too, I get too weird and mm-hmm. it, 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 it's like I appreciate the compliments too. Um, cuz I do get them a lot. But but <laughs> it's almost more fun for me to experience a connection with the person and to bond over training first. Mm. And then if they want to tell me later, then that's great. But like, I, I don't know. I, I get, I'm still getting weird about it, I guess. Maybe I just don't know how to take a compliment. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Just take it. <laughs> and then what? <laughs> so how's your day going? <laughs> Okay, so we, we start parkour in uh, Calgary, which for most people is uh, where? Ha! Um, it is like like basically the Midwest of, of Canada. Um, it's, you know, Vancouver, where we're at right now, is mm-hmm. on the coast. Uh, we're on the same coast as like Seattle, Portland, LA. Mm-hmm. Um, and then across the mountain range to our east. It's a big mountain range. Big mountain range is prairie is flat there's nothing except cows tornadoes and trucks <laughs> and 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 amidst all those three things right smack in the middle is calgary alberta mm-hmm. and and that's it that's it <laughs> that is the place i feel like people from outside of canada don't understand how middle of nowhere canada feels sometimes i think if it wasn't for the border, because like Seattle's not that far away. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, it's a couple hour drive, but because the border, it takes longer. But it just feels like there's so much separation in between cities where anytime I go to Europe or the US, it like, okay, so like California in the US, for example. Yeah. It's like I can go from LA and then I can go, I could even go to San Francisco. I could go and to, to people from there, they're like, that's so far. And I'm like, no, it's not, not compared to, yeah. <laughs> to where I come from. It's like the next major city over is, is you know wicked far it's like i'm either going to calgary or i'm going to seattle yeah yeah Se- seattle four hours away or calgary like at eight hour eight it, no it's got to be more than eight hours like more like 12 12 hour drive away it's been a while since i did that drive <laughs> we we drove back from um from pkbc mm-hmm. uh, and it's such a long drive that you know you got we, we were like rotating drivers and stuff mm-hmm. and i was getting so tired i was so new to driving and I was like, guys, can we pull over, change drivers? They're like, yeah, uh, soon, 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 soon. And we were going down this hill, and I fell asleep. Like, I fell asleep while driving. And, like, just for a split second, and swerved into the oncoming lane and almost hit two two motorcycle guys. But that's the kind of length of drive it is. <laughs> Everyone was okay. But, yeah, make sure to switch drivers when you do that. When you came out to Vancouver to, like, move here, did you did you fly or did you drive? I flew, I flew, but I really would have preferred driving because <laughs> I still like, I, I miss that drive. That, that's, that's like a, a iconic drive. It's like epic mountain ranges and you're going up and down and there's cool little tiny towns you could train in and stuff. Like, no, I just, I just flew. I, pa- I put all my stuff into boxes and mailed it. Oh, I didn't even do that at the start. I, j- I just flew on to, to Lucas Othmer's couch with a suitcase. I mm. lived with him for like two months. Uh, I forgot about your connection with Lucas. Yeah. But when you came out here, I feel like 
the the Josh Dewey I know was a Josh Dewey who was trying to really make it as like a parkour athlete. Mm-hmm. Um, and do you do you feel would you agree? Like that was the main focus, like pre moving out to Vancouver. Or your oh, pre moving out to Vancouver, yeah, yeah, yeah. So what? And then I guess what made the decision to move to Vancouver, and what did you envision at the time was going to happen coming out this way? So I I came to Vancouver for acting school, um, and I actually wasn't even expecting it. I I was living in a small town at the time of of getting into this school. Like there was nothing to do. I had keys to a gymnastics gym. And I would just go there and train and throw down. Um, I actually learned a ton of sick moves like that. It was actually a pretty sweet time. I would just go to the lake there. I had a little chair I could wear as a backpack, and I would set up on the beach and read poetry. Like it was, it was actually like a like a iconic existence. Um, but I hated it because mm-hmm. I was like, I am far away from friends. Mm-hmm. I I am just yeah. I, I feel. I felt I felt very stagnant, even though it was mm. such a small period of time, and everything about the place was honestly great. But I was so bored one day; like there was just nothing to do. Like I would play tons of Smash Bros, and I would binge TV shows and play Zelda and stuff. And like I, I, I binged all of Game of Thrones while I was out there. Like I would wake up, eat, watch Game of Thrones, train, sleep, and that was my existence for a little bit. And one day I was like, "There's." gotta be more life than this and i started looking up just like colleges because my parents have been bugging me like when are you gonna do school are you gonna do school 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 and i was like fine and i I looked up uh architecture school and because like parkour gives you an appreciation for architecture Mm -hmm. i always saw myself going into some kind of field like that before parkour i looked up architecture school and the requirements were like you need this and i was like nope and then uh i looked up acting school because that was like the next thing I was interested in I was starting to get into acting I had done a few I had done a student film that had a lot of impact on me in Calgary um, where like on set I had the same feeling that my best my first best my first good day in parkour gave me and that that's a thread that I've always kind of followed was that like there, there's like a very distinct feeling of like I gotta go fully into this thing, mm-hmm. uh, and acting gave me the same thing. So I looked up acting schools Vancouver because I knew there was a film industry here. And I looked up one, and Lucas was on the website. I was like, "Yo, you go to this school?" And at the time, like he was attending it or he was about to graduate, uh, and he was really stoked on acting. He was really stoked on school at the time. And can you can you fill people in on uh, just for those that don't know who, who Lucas is? Legend. <laughs> total <laughs> like parkour legend vancouver local parkour legend for sure um springs for legs from the yukon um iconic use of foals um had dubs on lock and just like the spinniest springiest style and he he was my main vancouver contact like anytime i'm going to vancouver after pkbc lucas Lucas's place was the place to go. Mm. So when I would come for SPL, formerly known as uh, NAPC, (laughs) for those who don't know, uh, when I would come for NAPC, I would stay on Lucas's couch and like, Mm. if I'm visiting Lucas's place, like it was always that. So to see like my main Vancouver connection, my main homie, like we stayed in contact all the time. Like we were just the the closest of homies. To see his name on the website, I was like, that's a crazy cosign. And he was like, dude, if if you enroll for this school, It'll be the best thing you ever do, and I don't know if he if he still feels that way or or whatever. But like he was right, <laughs> and and so I was kind of sold, but I wasn't feeling committal. Like acting was really scary at the time; just didn't know how to approach it. Um, and I emailed the school um, that he went to with a few questions about like, hey, like how does the auditioning work? And they totally misinterpreted, it and they're like, we can book you for an audition tomorrow. <laughs> I was like, what? So. Uh, obviously I said yes because when life gives me something like that um, Mm -hmm. I just got to go for it like I just got to like send it this is this is this is such a long origin story but it was my birthday weekend Mm -hmm. and I was living in Cold Lake which is close to Edmonton Edmonton has the biggest mall in in Canada one of the biggest ones in North America so obviously for my birthday I'm going to go do water slides because in the mall they got a huge water park that I've been going to my whole life so it's water slides birthday I've got this audition I'm working on, and it turns out one of the guys that I worked on this student film with that had a ton of impact on me worked in the same mall. So I went up 
I, I went and met up with him at this restaurant he was working at. He taught me how to get it all going, uh, get, get an aud- like make an audition make sense, how to make it your own, how to break down the structure of it, it was blah, blah, blah. And then he got me ready for this audition. I did the audition over Skype and the, the auditor's um, camera went down, which was awesome because I was shitting myself. Like, I was like, oh God. So when their camera went out, I was like, epic. I'm going to deliver this to a black screen. No stakes. Um, and I ended up getting into the school. And so I, I was like, yeah, I got I to gotta move to Vancouver. I got to do this thing now because I've, I've got school. I got to go. And I'd always wanted to move to Vancouver and never had a, had a chance, had a, there was never anything that had pushed me in that direction. So it was really nice to have something outside of me to be like, well, gotta go do this now. And that's how I ended up in Vancouver. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. And so up until that point, um, I'm saying, I, I feel like you were, you were trying to like push yourself as like, like Josh, Josh, the the athlete. Yeah. Um, had you uh, like made any like international connections at that point? Big had, time. Yeah. Big time. Like that, I, that was 2017. Mm-hmm. And by that point I had, I had toured with Farang. Um, I had been to For the Love. I had gone to my first um, international competition, which was the GCA Parkour Games in 2014. Made a ton of connections there with um, people who I had met through Youth Parkour on Facebook, which was like a huge, huge networking tool at the time. I had no mm-hmm. idea how pivotal that would be. But you had people like DK, Sean mm-hmm. Batista, Alfred Scott, Johnny Donahoe, who was like huge at the time, like tons of people there um, from youth parkour um, showed up to the GCA games, made a ton of connections there. Um, and I came back for Dodo Free Run, uh, Alfred Scott's team's um, Gucci Miss. Mm-hmm. And they made me like a custom shirt that said Team Dodo Doey. So it said mm-hmm. Team Dodo Doey. And that shirt's got to be somewhere. Like, <laughs> I, I hope it is. Um, but point being was, yeah, b- before even moving here, I, I had attended a bunch of events, ne- never placed high or anything like that. Like, mm-hmm. I've I've never been good in competition. Even now, like if someone's like, "Do a style competition," I'm like, "Ooh, that sounds scary." Like, I don't know. And I'd even when when I was living in that small town, Cold Lake, even at that time, I was flown out to Michigan, where I judged the parkour competition and road tripped to Denver, met up with Store, road tripped with Store, and then went back to England and made a video with them. So there was already like a lot of um, parkour notoriety mm. happening. I find it, I, I found it like initially when you like befriended the stores, I found that like a very unlikely thing <laughs> because of the like differential in, in what type of parkour they do mm-hmm. and kind of the type of parkour that you embrace and I, th- that was just like wild to me because I, I, th- I think there was a point in time where this may have been pre-vancouver after vancouver but because you're the guy that like announces stuff mm-hmm. and i think there was some uh, some chatter from you about like meeting up with store and like and i was like no way <laughs> like or i'm gonna be in an episode of like store blog and i was like no way <laughs> this guy because <laughs> because like why why would they be interested in what you do but yeah. it's but I, I think it was just like the personality match that, that did it big personality match because like they they are like a core part of my dna um and then a uh, josh from store um chris thompson uh and jesse laflair and i all planned on making a video together mm-hmm. Uh, and I talked about it a little bit in our upcoming episode on the store podcast, so I'll try not to go over it uh, ad nauseum. But yeah, we, we had already kind of had a plan in the works. I think Max had been following me for a little bit. I had met um, Sasha in Brighton because I went to visit um, Normal Brand, which is based, based in Norwich in the east UK, e- east of London. Uh, and from there, I kind of went on a road trip. I visited Giles because I had met him at uh, Off the Edge when they came here for their tour. Uh, and then from there, I was like, okay, I'll go check out Brighton and just had the best time of my life. Like I fell in love with Brighton. Brighton's where my soul goes when I, when I die, like I'm just going to go there and stare at the ocean and, <laughs> and mess with birds and stuff. But yeah, that, that, there was, there was some like inklings of connections and stuff. And I had already kind of fully understood how connections work in parkour. Cause in my experience, you go to an event, you meet somebody, you're not best of friends right away. Maybe you are. That's great. Um, but my experience has always been you meet somebody and you're both, you know, somewhat charmed by each other, but not, not like completely sold or anything. And then the next time you see each other, you're best friends. That's how it's always worked for me. And, and so 
I guess, I guess that's kind of how that happened. Because, yeah, I met, I think, maybe even Callum and Sasha in you know, State of Their Place. And then when I met up with them on Roof Cult Tour, I was like, oh, Sasha, yo. And then I've been talking with Josh. And, uh, yeah, yeah so it, it, all, it all kind of fell together naturally. Do you feel like you, it's, it seemed, I guess I'll rephrase this, it seemed like uh, around that sort of time, like when you first moved out to Vancouver and everything, again, I talk about like Josh, the athlete, again, from the outside looking at it, it, it always seemed like you wanted to eventually become like this sponsored athlete, the, the sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Is that like still something that you're pushing for? Big or? time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I, and I, I would, I think I'm like closer than I've ever been because I feel like my style's fi- like it, it's starting to settle into like a pretty sick place. Mm-hmm. Um, it's still oh, like it's it's been a long time dream of mine. Like even um, way back in the days of Calgary, I had a list of companies I wanted to work with, and I was like cold calling them and like DMing them and trying to get that to happen. And like yeah, even even these days, like I'm really pushing the athlete side because I'm just enjoying parkour so much. There's so much new stuff and that it's so inspiring to see it happening all the time and I feel like the point that I'm at with my training and the approach that I've got I feel like I'm still adding something to the zeitgeist mm. and and I'm excited to do that and I, I, I want to do it more mm. but one thing I found was like it's so hard to get a company to get behind you because mm. in parkour you have Red Bull. Some athletes have got on board with like certain clothing companies, but for the most part, like the sponsorship route has been delegated to either a 10% discount code with profits, which is basically a pyramid scheme, is it not? Or you are one of the sickest athletes in the game and Red Bull's got the cosign. Um, and I'm not like, I'm just, I'm not that guy. I'm never going to be the best at anything that I do because that's not even the point because there can only be one best and yeah I'm just I'm not even interested in that like that that's not on my radar at all. So the way I've kind of approached it is like I'm trying to sponsor myself. Mm. That's where the movement comes in and you know like yes I like I want to use the the movement to you know, bring in a little bit more part, like bring in a bit more uh, economy to parkour as well. Like I eventually I want to sponsor teams and stuff like if, if that ever becomes a thing. But yeah, the, the movement's been a great tool for doing that because before, before the movement to travel anywhere to be sponsored, I had to be a part of something. I had to be, I had to join up with Team Farang. I had like, I had the pleasure of, of joining up with with store, I, I like all, all of these things would pop up, and there was so many other opportunities happening in parkour that I felt like I wasn't being considered for, and I felt like it was because I didn't have any kind of attractive enterprise. There was there was no reason to bring me out, and and now with the movement, I've been so lucky to have some kind of a draw. But between that and commentating and emceeing and stuff. Now there is a reason to bring me out. Now now I do feel like I'm the sponsored athlete. And now because that entertainment side is rising alongside with my passion and the movement side is starting to rise as well, it's all kind of like fusing in into the DNA of like, ho- hopefully it's fusing into the DNA of a professional athlete. Mm. Yeah. So at what point did the, the podcast start? Because that was before before the movement. Yeah. The podcast was my way of making stuff in the early stages of, of COVID. Cause my, so it was, it was 2020? It was 2020, oh, yeah. Okay. And I had, I had everything I needed to start a podcast. I had a backdrop. I had a, I had a desk. I had a monitor so I could watch myself. And yeah, I, j- I just had everything I needed because I asked myself, what does my ideal life look like? There was a lot of things already in place. But one thing that was missing was I've always wanted to have my own show, my own podcast. And so I kind of just decided to use all these tools that I have and make as if I had my podcast studio and just make something. Like I was following a lot of um, comedians like Chris D'Elia, um, Theo Vaughn. Like I listened to a lot of like Joe Rogan, like just tons of comedians and at the time I was most interested in 
the comedian who can sit there and free associate and be funny somehow. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I kind of styled myself as a funny person. I was starting to get into stand-up myself. And I had decided that I have the type of brain where I can sit in front of a camera and free associate for 20 to 80 minutes. Um, and so I just decided to take that on as a challenge of like, okay, how long can I do this? Um, can I do this once a week? Um, if, if I'm scared, can I do this? If I'm, if I smoke weed, can I do this? If I'm sick, can I do this? It it, it was all just like, uh, the idea of just challenging myself, which is like, I don't know when I, when I, when I see somebody who's like, Oh, I just did this to like challenge myself. I'm like, Oh, well, I don't know. It feels like it takes away the authenticity of it a Mm. little bit, but I don't know. something, Something felt valid and needed and required. And I didn't know anything would like come from it, which was kind of funny because there was, there was just, there's just nothing to do. I just wanted to make something. Mm. And then, yeah, the, the podcast, um, get up kind of came out of nowhere and mm. I was able to just, yeah, combine all my talent to make something. All right. So, so what was the, cause I mean, we'll, we'll be, we want to see it. It didn't quite get the attention that the movement gets. <laughs> no. So what was the progression like then from, from doing that? Cause, cause I think that was, and, and how much of, uh, I guess, how, how much of the podcast was like parkour based? Zero. Zero. Okay. Zero. There was nothing to do with parkour in the podcast. I was even in a funny stage of like, you know, I was just out of par- I was just out of acting school. And while I was in acting school, I had this, uh, this classic Josh approach of like, I'm doing this new thing. And while I'm doing this new thing, I don't want to focus on anything else. So I even like at, at one point when I was living here, I had kind of felt like I was on the outs with parkour. Like I just had let parkour go at a certain point. I was even, I was, I was more interested in tricking for like, like eight months or something like that. Like I didn't, I barely trained parkour. I wasn't finding joy in it. Um, my, my old approach wasn't doing anything for me. And yeah, I, more or less like it, it was just completely out of, out of my focus. What was, what was the, how did I get there? What, what was the, the yeah, base so, question? So we're going from, you're doing the podcast. It's funny that you mentioned that that tricking phase too, because I, I I remember that as well. Yeah. And I I found it weird because I was like, oh, Josh has such a flip heavy style. I feel like Josh should be doing more like part more like traditional parkour, but you went like the realm of tricking. <laughs> um, oh, how yeah. Did the and so come and so yeah, you're yeah. so you're out in Vancouver. Um, you come out here trying to be the sponsored athlete. Yeah. You get to uh, acting school. COVID hits. You start doing a podcast. Yeah. At what? At, so at a certain point, you stopped doing the podcast because you were very consistent. Yeah. Um. And and I think you said like making that a personal like exercise. I can really resonate with that because that's a big part of what like STS is. And we've taken mm-hmm. breaks from it, but you know, starting to get to the point with STS where I can just like flip on a camera, you know, even look into the lens or or talk and look at you and like be like, we're recording, but mm-hmm. it's all good. Yeah. And I'm going to try to get better. I'm going to try not to um as much. I'm going to try not to like as much. I'm just going to try to see if I can get ideas across Mm -hmm. live, basically, and not chop this up and edit it. Mm -hmm. So that really resonates with me trying to to do something like that. But at a certain point, that ended. And then at a certain point, the movement started. Was that that like a... I can't remember. Was that like a big like cutoff, or was there some time in between the two? There was there was a bit of time. So I when when I was living in that basement in Kitsilano with my studio with the like the little podcast setup that I would make and everything. I, I was doing a lot of stand up, uh, and I was in the stand up community group um, on Facebook. And inside the group, someone made a posting that they were looking for um, crew on on a podcast um, with two. Um, big stand-up comedians, Dino Archie and Marito Lopez. Um, yeah, they're just looking for like a camera guy, uh, potentially editing this and that. And I had felt like the work that I put in on my own podcast qualified me for it. Um, so I I applied for it and got the job. And it, it wasn't it, it wasn't like an official job or anything like that. It was basically like show up and film this for like fifty bucks a session. Uh, and then uh, at least you got paid. I did, yeah, <laughs> which was which was fantastic. Um, so I, I showed up on my first day and already I was having a crisis. I was like, oh my God, like, am I starting to go down the pathway of being just a camera guy? Like, I want to be in front of the camera. But I decided to put that all away for a little second and just nose to the grindstone and like just witness these two comedians being so freaking funny. They were just the most hilarious guys. Um, we had this venue, uh, Bar None downtown in uh, Yaletown, Vancouver. 
Um, and there was like great lighting and the equipment was very like sophisticated. Like I had this like 20 pound camera on my shoulder and I'm doing like office style, like snap zooms in on them. And like, I, I had a lot of free license with it. And I did a ton of episodes with them, eventually became like a part-time editor with them. I did clips for them and it all started to become like quite easy and natural. And I learned quite a bit from Jordan, the, the producer on that. And he had all the equipment and he funded it himself because he's a, a VFX guy in film. Um, so he basically spearheaded the entire thing. And then at, around, around that time, the, the, the podcast that I was doing started to peter out. I had moved into this big apartment and there was a lot of work going on upstairs. And I, had li- I was living with a, a famous musician, Curtis Waters, who did the song, like, I'm a pretty boy, I'm stunning. Super speed, you know that one? I don't know. This oh, one. you know, oh, TikTok I'm, famous song. I'm, I'm old, man. Billion yeah. streams. Really? Oh, I'm, not, I'm not on the talk. <laughs> well, yeah, um, he, he was a childhood friend of Joby, who I was living with at the time. And we were all living together. Um, and the living situation just didn't feel conducive to doing the show anymore. So it, it kind of petered out. Um, so now my focus is on this comedy podcast. I'm just working on that. And the show gets to a point where they're getting their own studio. And so they get their own podcast studio. They're doing that kind of stuff. I'm setting things up. And then the need for me kind of diminishes because mm-hmm. there's no more setup required. Um, Jordan's doing the bulk of the editing. There's just, yeah, I, and I was too busy. There's, I was doing a lot of film stuff at the time as well, a lot of acting. And then it came to me one day while I was doing my acting classes, like, I want to have my own personal project. There is a studio that I can use with all the equipment and I just have to ask. And so I asked Jordan, he was down. How long did that take? Uh, sorry, just the, 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 the idea, journey between the, the idea of, I just have to ask to gain the courage to ask. Was that, is that a quick thing for you or is that something that you I've had never, anxiety about for a long time? No, I've never had a problem asking for stuff. I will, I, I've, I've never, ever, ever had a problem asking for things. And if anything, I'll ask for too much. Mm. I read this book called The Art of Asking, and it's, it's about artists getting patronage and things like that. And I've always understood that on the artist path, it does require a lot of like connection. And it does, it does require, you, you just got to ask people for stuff. And I've never been a stranger to that. Like I, I asked Store if I could join them on their tour. I, <laughs> I even asked Team Farang if I could join the team because they, they'd take me on this tour. It felt like everything was kind of moving in the right direction. I was like, I'll just ask. I've, I've asked famous comedians and actors to just hang out with them. Like I've, I've, I've never, ever had a problem with just asking if I can be included in something or if somebody could do something for me. Cause the worst thing that's going to happen is they're going to say no, mm. or even they're just not going to respond. And then you just overthink it forever. Mm. But no, I've never had a problem asking for anything. That's interesting. I feel like so many guys, like particularly your age or a bit younger, that's, that's a big fear is, is rejection. Right. But what, what then? Like, so, so someone says no, mm. Do it yourself. That, I guess. I guess that was that. That that was the stakes for me. Was like, mm-hmm. if I don't do the show in the studio, I guess I'll just make it myself. Mm-hmm. That that was the worst case scenario. Because like, at the end of the day, the movement doesn't require the studio. I think the studio makes it magic, and I think it's a really big important part. But if the studio didn't exist, the show still could. Mm-hmm. But just the, like, because of how it fits in with my dream for life to have a podcast studio where I can show up, camera's ready, desk is there. Like, I've written all my material. I sit down, I do the show, I leave. I don't have to move a desk around in my, in my house. I don't have to set up all these lights, this and that. I, I, I just felt like there was no reason not to ask. Mm-hmm. And so I quit my acting class immediately because it, there's too much stuff to juggle between all that stuff. I asked about the show, immediate yes. Um, because he, he was actually, uh, Jordan was trying to get me to start my own show before then. Like he was like, you're funny, you're interesting. Like what kind of stuff could, like, could you make a parkour show? Could you do a parkour podcast? Mm-hmm. And, and I didn't like the idea at first. Like, what am I gonna do? And then just the, the, 
the archetype of like the flow, like the parkour update show came to me. And then I was like, oh yes, like I can, I get to do the comedy podcast I've always wanted to do without having to be a stand up comedian. Um, and then I, I get to be the director without having to be a PA for 20 years or whatever. I get to be the writer with no qualifications because this niche has occurred and provided a home for all of those talents. And the funny thing is like, if you, if it, it, it's, it's, it's a potential that if I continue down that path, those other things could become an option as well. The directing or the, the comedy aspect or the writing, the acting, like that stuff tends to facilitate or tends to be facilitated by the success of passion work like that. Yeah. So it immediate. Yes. What does the, uh, it's, it's Harbor student Harbor work? podcast studios. Harbor podcast. Yeah. What did they get out of this? If anything, like you did some work for one of the shows they were producing, yeah. which got you the in, yeah. but it doesn't sound like you're paying for the, for the space, for the time. I give them a cut of the Patreon now. But, okay. but that, that was never like a, a, it was never a given. And Jordan just did it like out of the kindness of like believing in me. And I don't even know how much he believed in me, but it was enough to just but let me show up and do it. There's no, like, is, did you have to sign an agreement to use the space nope. or anything? No, so this is all just like handshake deals and, and favors and high fives and stuff. Yeah, because, because <laughs> part of me working for him was also that. Like sometimes I would go and show up and do a favor or like if, if, and, but he would pay me because he had money at his disposal and um, me doing the favors back like, like that 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 was what I was able to give so there there's just been kind of a fun like outside of money exchange there, but also also acknowledging that like with the show reaching a certain level of success, I do feed money back into it like I just sold an episode of the show and it's paying for rent this month mm. and part part wait, of wait 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 what do you mean you sold an episode so i i went to i don't, I don't even know how much of this like i can talk about mm. like there's there like there's no restrictions on it but like just from like a stri- strictly a business standpoint like i went to an event well, yeah. actually well, the episode's going to come out anyway so i went to the WFPF event uh, in austin okay and, and uh while, while we were in the car um Robbie, who runs the WFPF, mm-hmm. he runs USA Parkour. He asked me um, how much for an episode of the show, mm-hmm. a dedicated episode of the show. Mm-hmm. And I've been asked that before. Um, Adam Dunlap asked me how much for the rights to air the show, which obviously the, the show runs off of my credibility, runs mm-hmm. off my credit. So that's kind of social suicide doing it. Sorry, mm-hmm. Adam. Not sorry. <laughs> but that would basically be career suicide. So I just quoted him a stupid high number. Mm-hmm. I was like, dude, per month. 3,000 US, which was like a crazy high number for me. I, I don't know. But he was like, okay, maybe I could do that. And we haven't talked since. And if anything, I've slandered him on the show. He doesn't like me anymore. Thank God. <laughs> but when I was in Austin last month, Robbie asked me how much to do, uh, how much for an episode of the show. And I quoted him the same price. And I, I was in the car with like Stas and Kobe and everyone. So, you know, the homies are around. And of course, like I'm going to like, you know, I'm going to big dog and you know like mm-hmm. yeah it's gotta be three thousand bucks and then yeah if you want to renew your license it's gotta be this much um but we we circled back to the discussion because he did he did seem interested and it's easy enough for me to talk about an event that i've been to mm-hmm. i said for a, a two to four minute episode it's this much money mm-hmm. uh he came back to me with a number that i was happy with and so that's been the first episode of the show sold okay yeah you, you had already told me about this and i, I went, but when you said sold an episode yeah i was my brain went somewhere else like oh, went to okay like, went to like something because we were talking about the harbor podcast studio and yep. stuff and i'm like wait they like someone from this realm like gave you money I, I, no. like, within parkour that makes I more sense but i am i am trying to get red bull to pick the show up mm-hmm. like i'm i'm actively mm-hmm. uh, i'm i've bugged every red bull athlete i know because i know quite <laughs> a few um and i message red bull canada constantly red bull free running constantly mm-hmm. i know who runs the stuff i'm messaging them and there's been a bit of a dialogue back and forth um with with those people and there has been some interest like it's kind of like ri- risen and mm-hmm. fallen um, and it's it's rising again. Like I, I've been talking to another key player, and mm-hmm. they they think that it would be uh, also a great idea to join forces because I think mm-hmm. it'd be great to get Red Bull involved back in the show or uh, mm-hmm. Red Bull involved back in the community. I think mm-hmm. the show would have a great place, uh, and I just want to wear a Red Bull hat. <laughs> but but I, I I don't know. I I think that the show would have a 
the the show's reach is limited because mm-hmm. it people will only see it if people share it, mm-hmm. and I only have so many followers. So realistically, if nobody shares the show, the maximum number of people that can see it is twelve thousand. That's the number of followers I have right now. Mm-hmm. Um, but if it's up on Red Bull, they have X bajillion followers. Then its its potential to reach more people increases exponentially. Mm. So if I do if if I was ever to sell the show, it would it would be in in that regard. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. So I want to go back to episode one. Yeah. You finish recording it, you cut it up and everything, and you post it. What's going through your mind? Hope it's not shit. <laughs> <laughs> I hope I hope people enjoy this. I have started a few. I've started quite a few personal projects. So right away, I had very low expectations. I had made the resolution to not judge the product in any way. Don't worry about it until it's finished, until it's settled. Nothing that I had ever created content-wise has ever taken on YouTube, on Instagram, whatever. Like I feel like I've got like the, the, the Midas touch, but in the opposite direction. Like I've got like a shit touch when it comes to co- content for some reason. Um, so I had I had negative expectations and it blew up right away. Like I I don't know if if it was because maybe like Dom shared it or something like that or I don't know. There was such a void to be filled that it took immediately. I think the episode shot up to like 20k like right off the bat. Mm-hmm. I was like, oh my god! Like episode one, it's already blown up. That's not gonna happen again. And then I post the next episode, same thing happens. Next mm-hmm. episode, same thing happens. Um, and every once in a while, there's a bomb, which like is not even that bad. Like it's like any, anything in the ballpark of like 10k views is like I would consider a, a like a bomb. But even then, it's like I'm still reaching 10,000 people. Mm-hmm. But yeah, the the initial reception to it just like blew me away. But it made perfect sense because it was a combination of everything I'm passionate about. Yeah, and. And so right then, I, th- I think, like, was it just clear, like, okay, this is, this is going to work. People will appreciate this. Mm-hmm. And I can start just committing to this, like, weekly and, and make episodes. And it's just going to grow from here. Yeah. Is that pretty much how it felt? It made sense right away. And then there was also, like, immediate effects of it. Uh, I actually don't, don't know the distance between these two things happening. But when, uh, between the show starting uh, and me getting flown out to my first event... Um, because of the show, it just immediately made it evident that there is such a need for the show and that the payoff for it is so direct. Because the show does take a lot of time to edit. And like sometimes even when I'm writing, I'm like, ah, like this is like so much work, even though it's like very fulfilling ar- artistic work. And it's it's a f- tremendous project. Like sometimes I just have to remind myself that like there are direct payoffs from doing this Mm -hmm. you making this episode is what gets you to omfg this is what gets you to to do this stuff so it it all pays off in the sense of like i get to go and enjoy the parkour career that i've always dreamed of having because of the show Mm. okay so earlier you talked about uh if someone else wants to do the same thing like go ahead go do it like you can't do it like me right yeah okay so i'm gonna ask the question for myself, but also for um, other people. Mm-hmm. You choose to answer for me or for whoever you want. As I mentioned, I've been a little checked out with the, the content lately. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm trying to pick things up. I'm trying to come up with original ideas for Origins, because um, right now I do all the social media for, for Origins as well. It seems to be working. Uh, I mean, <laughs> Viral. <laughs> yeah, we had that one, you know. Um, yeah. I, I've been just trying to come up with like original content, mm-hmm. um, but it's slower, because as soon as you're trying to hit a qual- quality point, it's slower. And I feel like I did the same thing with my own personal use of, of uh, like social media. Like I, I kind of went into this thought process of, oh, I want to just start doing something that's more uniquely me mm-hmm. um, on on uh, my my account, and then some, and then something that's uniquely Origins on Origins account, and kind of just separate the two. Yeah. Um, but I've been kind of stuck. I've been kind of stuck on like not knowing what I want to share. Mm-hmm. And when I talk about like doing like training clips, are the I get tired of seeing other people's. Like I, I get tired. Of, I just get checked out of like scrolling through other people's training clips. Like, Can't, I relate. Don't, <laughs> Can't relate. Can't. Yeah, you're 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 totally <laughs> opposite. But I'm just like, oh, just, you know. And then. I just that just makes me not want to post mine because I I from do you agree or not that like you should basically be sharing the kind of stuff you want to see? Yeah, 
Because that's how I feel. I, yeah. I feel like I don't, if, if I, if me who doesn't know me is looking at this, do you, you know what I mean? Like, would they be into it? Because um, if the answer is no, I don't want to share it. And that goes for like YouTube videos, that goes for Instagram, that goes for everything for me. I think that could be so, so like self limiting though. Like, if, if you're only posting oh, stuff for, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't, I don't think that's helpful to mm -hmm. think that way like okay. I, I i think that you have no idea what people will find interesting because mm -hmm. you exist in the brain you exist in okay. and the things you know are known to you so i had this idea and you tell me if, if you think it's worth doing or not i was going to um because for i for a while like i've gone through seasons of like posting a lot of stories mm -hmm. where it's like hey i'm training hey i'm doing this yeah hey here's this right here's what's going on today and again, I just be like, what am I doing? Like, I'm not really providing anyone value. I'm just kind of pretty much, it just, it just doesn't feel like I'm doing anything other than for myself, but I don't, I don't even really care that I do it. Mm -hmm. So uh, I had this idea that I was going to try to post. One day I was just going to post a bunch of stories. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking I will just post, I will story like every, everything I spend my time doing from like, here's what I'm eating, Here's what I'm. Here's what I'm. Here's the boring work I'm doing for the gym. Here's uh, the boring work I might be doing for SPL. Here's the boring training I'm doing. Here's a, just stuff that I don't think is worthy, and just just put it out there. And then what I was thinking is doing like a poll or uh, a suggestion that like, hey, if any of this stuff interests you, because this is the this is the documentation of the stuff that I do on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. uh, like the story, the stories that get the most likes, I'll start making content around that. Do you think it's a good idea or a bad idea? I mean, it's not a it's not a bad idea necessarily. I think it gives you a direction, and I think that's the most important part of making any kind of content is to just start making stuff. Mm -hmm. But I don't think worry so much about how it's being received. I I think even the idea of looking at it as boring is limiting in it, in itself because like. There is variety to what you do, and you do spice up the way that you live, or else you're not. You wouldn't be interested in living the way that you do. So there, there is something like inherently interesting to what you do, whether you find it novel or not. And I think there's just value. There, even the value of of sharing it is just being connected with the people you're connected with online, and to engage in the planet that you're living on and to contribute to the turning of said planet. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I think that if you, if you can find a way out of regarding it as boring and to explore what is new that's happening and to be excited to share it, I think that can create a more like, Authentic content delivery. <laughs> do you, let me ask this: do you, do you follow what Jimmy Davidson and Chris Hollingsworth are doing right now? No. Okay, so they made an account. I believe it's Movement Most Mentors. Mentors. Okay, yeah. I do know it a little bit. But, and yeah. I know I don't know what Chris's overall. I think Chris's overall goal is like coaching advice, and mm -hmm. Jimmy's overall goal is business advice. Jimmy, I don't know so much about Chris, but Jimmy, um, from what I've seen and from what I know about what he's doing. He is way ahead of the game when it comes to parkour gym ownership. And I'm really happy that he's doing what he's doing. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not consuming a lot of it, but I'm just happy to see that like he's, he's pursuing it. Um, this is the type of stuff that I'm kind of interested in putting out content in. I've, I've tried it before where like I'm interested in putting out information about how to train for parkour. Mm -hmm. But I'm also interested in like putting out content about things you could be doing as like a parkour business owner, a parkour entrepreneur. And like this, share what you're doing. Yeah. So yeah. I kind of this, I would start sharing about like some things I've learned and, and doing. Um, but this is kind of what interests me more. And I just haven't really started yet. I mean, mm -hmm. I start, I've done posts in the past where it's like, here's how to like organize your training and here's how to do kind of stuff like that. Yeah. That's the kind of stuff I like, I enjoy doing. Mm -hmm. I don't enjoy sharing my actual training anymore. Even if I'm really proud of like, I'm really happy with like a session and like a, a line or a jump I did. It doesn't, I kind of wanted those posts to be like fewer and the other content to be more, if that makes sense. I think that's valid, but uh, yeah, as, as long as you're, yeah, just, just, just share things that go on in your life. I, yeah, I yeah. guess, I guess the tricky part for me, and this is why I thought like, oh, maybe if I just start posting stories, it'll work because I don't know how, 
to me, it's all because I'm in it. To mm-hmm. me, it's all like regular stuff, right? Mm-hmm. And it's one of those things where, like, I think regular to me, like, I might have a, an idea about training or a cue or um, an exercise that to me is just a regular thing. Everyone must know this because mm-hmm. it's regular. Mm-hmm. And then I'll post about it, and people are like, I never thought about doing this. Yeah. Right? But well, it's you, really you put, hard for me to decipher what those things are. Yeah. Well, um, you, you, you put so much time and energy in, into those things that it's probably more or less impossible for the average story viewer to have thought about that mm. because, of, because of your passions and your focus and the areas that you're putting your energy into. You have to just assume that nobody's thinking these things or, or at least be open to the idea that what you're saying could be obvious, mm-hmm. but don't let that stop you. Mm-hmm. Like, just go ahead and look stupid if you got to. But yeah, I, I would I would be interested in in seeing you share like yeah th- things that you're thinking about or ideas that you have because like that's why I come to advanced class. That's why I'm showing up to weightlifting. Like you you've always got some kind of new information or new knowledge that I'm able to under like because of your understanding of it, you help me understand, and then I'm able to uh, enhance my training through that. No one else is really like. No one else in my life is is approaching training in that way, or no one else is approaching coaching in that way. So yeah, maybe, maybe just don't think of it all as obvious because it's been known to you. Because it, it it's almost like your attention is like a a spotlight, and this thing that you found out, you see this side of it, mm-hmm. but because of everyone else directing their lamp <laughs> lights in other directions it the side that they see is completely dark Mm -hmm. so that's your prerogative as a content creator is to share what your lamplight has brought to your attention Mm -hmm. whether it's interesting to you or not i don't know i think we're gonna have to talk about this some more sure another time but um okay so kind of the last thing i want to ask you about is let's let's imagine now like a younger josh who has all this creative energy, mm-hmm. um, maybe he's going to get into acting, does parkour and stuff, yep. wants to start a show. Very ambitious. But yep. maybe doesn't have like the confidence you had going into it. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, you said that you were not afraid to ask and stuff. Uh, what types of things do you tell yourself? Let it come. <laughs> like, just let these things come to you. And even the fact that you see these things happening for you already puts it in motion and not even in like a law of attraction kind of way like really the things that you focus on even in like a goal sense you're going to create your own kind of confirmation bias with the mishmash of chaotic surroundings you're going to use your reasoning to make sense of that in a way that suits your goals anyway So I think the main thing that I would tell that young, ambitious guy is like, don't try and have it all happen at once, even though at some point it will. When things happen, when good things happen, celebrate it, because there's been so many good things that have happened on this pursuit that I've taken no time to celebrate because I'm already thinking about the next thing. Like even at this point in my career, like I am a professional parkour athlete. I'm being flown to events. I have my own show and it's still not good enough because already my sights have shifted to like, how do I save for a house now? Like, (laughs) how can I start getting, how do I, like I'm getting paid for being at events. How do I get paid more for being at these events? Like if, if that younger Josh could just like celebrate the wins a bit more, and be more present and understand that like those goals some of them are further away than you think others are moments away and the timeline that you set for yourself like i thought i'd get into acting at 40 i thought i'd be a professional athlete at 18 Mm -hmm. i thought i would be winning art of motion at 19 like i there are certain benchmarks for success 
that you do just have to let go, release the timeline. But the fact that you want these things, that you're willing to work hard for them, or even that you're willing to work hard in one area is good enough. And if you can just settle in that hard work and not shift focus the second you tick off a goal and just celebrate it, it's not going to be so hard. And that's not to say that like I'm unhappy with where I am. I'm so stoked on where I'm at. But I would it would save me so many frustrated parkour sessions. Like there was times where I just hated parkour, but I got to keep going because I've got these goals. And eventually I got past those points, which is great, like awesome. But I think that if I just took the pressure of the timeline off of it and realized how much time I have to accomplish these things, all of it might might have been less frustrating. Mm. Yeah. Mm. That's great, man. Yeah. <laughs> I, I really think we should do um, we should do another one of these. I could easily talk for another 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 couple hours you here. No way can. Particularly on <laughs> particularly on uh, just like uh, some of these subjects and some other things we were talking about we didn't even touch on today. Uh, we do have to get out there because Lucas is probably losing his mind right now. We yeah, we're go, technically we on gotta shift. go coach. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but real quick, yeah. um, just to end this off, I want to do a little bit of a, a word association association with you. Okay. Uh, so I'm gonna say a word. Jason Paul. <laughs> <laughs> I need you friend. to either give me a word or two or, or a, just whatever, however you want to react. Okay, you ready? Yeah. All right. Trasseur. Ugh. <laughs> uh, weird French. <laughs> Parkour athlete. Nice. I feel that. <laughs> Free runner. It's okay. It, it provides understanding. Parkour artist. You don't get it. <laughs> Mover. Non-specific. <laughs> Parkourist. Why is that the word that we've settled on? <laughs> Why is that the one that we're taking? Out of all these ones, like parkourist, like... Why does that get the cosign from so many people? <laughs> but I, parkourist over tracer, over free runner. Parkour athlete is too long. Parkourist, really? A climist? Parkour? Uh, like, a, like call a climber a climist? A climbing athlete? I don't know. Cre uh... Flumper. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks a lot, man. Yeah, yeah. That's it for us today. Come on. We'll see you next week. Subscribe. <laughs>